Okay, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Ryu Ishimoto. I'm the uh, director of uh, ecosystems development at Midokura Japan. Uh, today I want to talk about the uh, WebAssembly-based uh, Edge AI Sensing Pipeline Orchestrator uh, for resource-constrained far-edge devices. It's a long title. Okay, so to start, I want to share uh, our vision. Uh, we're building a platform that is an ac um, accessible platform that powers and enables intelligent solutions based on distributed visual sensing. So it's a platform um, for uh, solution developers uh, who may not necessarily have expertise or deep knowledge in AI or uh, computer vision or uh, sensors to quickly build their own solutions and provide service. And also to uh, develop a visual sensing application uh, for various sensors out there okay, for, uh, that are used in uh, various protocols. So uh, to achieve this vision, I've listed um, six uh, mission statements here. Uh, first, we want to make sure that the application developed on this, on this platform can run on cheap and resource-constrained devices. Because we think that in IoT space, there's still a, a huge demand for these devices. And, but these devices are very difficult to develop on, so we want to uh, define a high-level abstraction so that it's easier for developers to develop. So with the high-level abstractions and the uh, components that implement the abstractions, we have a, a well-defined device stack. So the next step is I want to open source the device stack so that uh, uh, developers can easily get this device stack, get a device, uh, put the device stack, and develop on top of it. Uh, we believe that this is going to accelerate uh, adoption. And also, we want to lower the uh, operational cost um, because um, we want the developers to uh, quickly get their services started and uh, provide service painlessly. And you also want the, uh, these applications to run on far-edge devices, okay? Uh, devices that are closest to the place where the data is generated by sensors. This way, the uh, data is uh, processed at the edge, and it never leaves the, the device, right? So to, to preserve privacy. And eventually, we sort of envision our marketplace, a central place where uh, developers can upload their applications and, and share code. Okay, so uh, the agenda for this presentation, uh, I want to <clears throat> go through the challenges that we have to solve. Uh, then I'm going to introduce uh, EVP agent, which is the, uh, the component that we want to open source. Then I want to introduce uh, the cloud component of the platform. Uh, we call it Sensing Pipeline Service. And then we're going to have a demo, and then uh, um, uh, Kenji is going to go over the uh, ecosystem expansion that uh, we're working on. Okay, so here are the challenges we have to solve. Um, the application development is difficult for uh, these devices. Uh, when I say resource-constrained devices, I, I mean not just small Linux devices, but also uh, like a microcontroller unit with uh, real-time OSs, okay? So um, embedded programming in general is very hard, right? You typically uh, code in low-level languages, like C, C++, which may uh, alienate a lot, of, uh, a lot of developers out there. And uh, there's no component model to speak of, right? So you can't just download packages and, and build your logic on top of it. So there's not much reuse of code out there. Um, the features you develop um, are not very customizable, right? So you actually develop these features, put them on a device, and if you want to modify these features, you basically have to do like full OTA, right? So, uh, or get a new device. And, uh, and typically you, you code your application uh, to be device specific, right? Uh, so um, your code end up being, uh, when your code is device specific, and that, that code is no longer portable, right? So you can't take that code and run on different devices. And this is a problem uh, in IoT space because uh, in IoT, the devices and, and uh, real-time OS are still fragmented. So if you want to provide a service, especially in, in like a multi-tenant environment, you would have a case where you have uh, multiple applications running on a single device. 
So uh, you need to provide full isolation for the applications and, and proper memory protection. But uh, unfortunately, with uh, MCUs, uh, they don't really come with uh, uh, memory management units. So they don't provide memory protection at all. And uh, for the isolation technology, the container is way too heavy for these devices. And finally, we want to run these uh, in uh, at na uh, near native performance because uh, a lot of these applications on these far, uh, far edge devices are uh, critical applications. You know, they may be detecting critical events or handling critical events. So, which also basically means that the, you want these applications to run natively uh, instead of, uh, say, uh, interpreted code. Okay. So, how about the operation side? Okay. So, there are a lot of pain points there as well. Well, uh, if you want to provide a service, you, you need to uh, provide basic, basic IoT functions, right? like uh, device provisioning and device management and things like that. Uh, also, uh, if you want to uh, provide applications, then you need to have some sort of uh, application management as well, where people can download and, and consume these applications on their devices, right? or uh, maybe for developers to share uh, reusable code. And in the service, you probably want to support multiple devices or different types of devices, in which case uh, you know, they have different capabilities. right? So what you want to have is the automation of uh, the application having the proper access to the hardware resources, like sensors or the accelerators. And uh, these applications that run on the devices, they need to be connected to the cloud. Right, or maybe to uh, another application running somewhere. Right, so that needs to be configured. Um, and, uh, and the last case is interesting where, uh, because these are small devices, it's likely the case that an application may not run on that device. So you may actually have to split that up and run in different places. Okay, so you might run, you might run some workload on the device, and then maybe the output, output of that is sent over to a different place like uh, a different uh, a compute server on, on premise, or maybe um, a compute on Mac. Uh, Mac is a, a multi-access edge computing. It's edge computing compute resources that are provided by, uh, provided by telcos. Okay. So you may want to have a single application split up and deployed in multiple places. And how do you do that? Right. So EVP agent, uh, this is a component that we want to open source. Um, uh, EVP stands for Edge Virtualization Platform. Uh, we named it this way a couple of years ago when we started the project, but we're hoping that uh, once we open source it, the yeah, community members are going to come up with a better name. Um, so this agent is, uh, is a component that runs on a device. Uh, so firstly, it connects to the IoT uh, platform in the cloud. Okay? And, there's no, and it's designed to be IoT platform agnostic in that uh, it can easily be configured to, to integrate with different IoT platforms. Right now, we have a Things Board supported. I don't know if you guys know Things Board. It's an open source solution for IoT platform, uh, and, and several others as well. But uh, um, it can easily be configured and, and, and uh, integrated with others. And uh, by connecting to IoT platform, you get uh, device management and, and uh, basic IoT functions like telemetry for free. Okay, so um, it's also responsible for uh, the application lifecycle management on the device, right? You have to spawn the applications, uh, start, uh, initialize, uh, terminate, and clean up. And as I mentioned before, uh, we need to provide proper access to hardware resources on the device, right? And the EVP agent manages that. And uh, not only does it uh, provide access to the hardware for the, for the applications, he also reports uh, device information to the cloud. Uh, this information is useful because then the cloud can take that information and make a decision on whether the application can even run on this device or the, uh, the executable format that it needs to create to run on this device. So, and lastly, the network connectivity. Uh, these applications um, may be connected to, uh, to each other or maybe to the, cl to the cloud. Right, uh, maybe in different locations, or maybe on the same on the same device. And all of these, uh, all those cases are handled by the EVP agent. So, as for the isolation, uh, we've we've chosen WebAssembly as the uh, isolation technology. 
uh, for various reasons, which I'll go over next. But uh, just a side note, uh, EDP Asian does support containers. But uh, for the sake of this presentation, uh, I'm going to focus on WebAssembly. Okay. So uh, just like with IoT uh, platform, we want to design EDP Agent to be uh, WASM runtime agnostic as well. Right now, we have chosen one specific runtime, and I'll, and I'll explain how we ch chose one. But uh, by open sourcing, well, maybe hopefully the, it will end up being uh, having a design that is going to be uh, agnostic to runtime. Um, so EVP agent and CSDK, the SDK to, to develop applications for EVP will be open source very soon. Okay, so how do we come? Uh, how do we choose WebAssembly for runtime? Okay, so we looked at several, several options. Uh, Micro EJ was an uh, interesting one because it had all the features and stability that we needed, but uh, it was it's a commercial product, right? So we wanted to have uh, an open source solution for uh, to be able to customize, which was very important for us. And among all the open source options, WebAssembly was the best one because uh, it, it was it had the uh, it was the most future proof. It, we actually did more extensive evaluation, so if you're interested, um, I'd be more than happy to go over them later after the presentation. So how do we choose the runtime? Okay, so we had uh, we chose from the first three. So we evaluated the first three: the uh, Wasm time, Wasm three, and and WebAssembly micro runtime. Okay, and uh, we chose uh, WebAssembly micro runtime because uh, because uh, of the support for the different hardware architectures and and operating systems that we cared about. Uh, because of uh, familiarity, we we cared about the not X support, so they had that. And another important reason why we chose this uh, runtime is because uh, because of the support for uh, ahead of time compilation. Right, I mentioned before that the one of the goals we have is to make sure that the the Wasm application runs natively. Now, Wasm Edge, uh, we sort of discovered recently, it's an interesting project, and it's getting traction, so we're definitely watching it. Uh, but as I said before, uh, we want to design EVP agent in such a way that uh, we can swap these runtime. So it doesn't really matter which one you use, we just have, uh, we're just using WebAssembly micro runtime for now. Okay, so EVP agents on a device side. Okay, so next I want to I explain the, uh, um, the cloud side which we call a sensing pipeline service at, at a very high level here. So uh, sensing pipeline service is, is basically a collection of microservices on top of an IoT platform, which I mentioned earlier that it's, it's, it could be anything, right? Things board being one of them. Um, and it, is, it, is the, it provides features for solution developers to be able to uh, design a solution and also to instantiate it in a, in, in a physical world, like onto devices. Okay, so the way it goes is that the um, developer would uh, uh, design a solution and submit that design to the Sensing Pipeline service, right? and then Sensing Pipeline service will transform that into actual WebAssembly modules running on devices and maybe beyond devices. Um, and these WebAssembly modules will be running in the correct format of, of uh, executable. And the way it does that is by uh, it takes the uh, system information, device information that is reported by EVP agent. So the sensing pipeline service knows the architecture of the device, right, and the capability of the device. So you can do the ahead of time compilation to make sure that the the the, the Wasm source code is compiled properly to to uh, to end up with the right format, with the right binary format to run on that device. Uh, also, uh, based on the capability of the device, uh, it knows exactly where to deploy and also uh, provide access to the hardware. Right, so the application may need to access a sensor, so it tells the EVP agent to do so. Um, and and it can only, it'll only give access to those that uh, that is needed, right, and, and nothing more. Um, and finally, network connectivity. So. Um, I mentioned before that there, might, there may be cases where uh, you have an application split up and running in multiple places, or you, you might have applications, uh, multiple applications running on the same device. Either way, the connectivity is, uh, is, is uh, configured by the EVP agent and this, and this service. So the important concept here is that um, we, we, there are two different stages here, right? The, the solution design and the instantiation of the solution. 
So the concept is that the developers don't really need to worry about the instantiation of the solution design because that part is taken care of entirely by, by Sensing Pipeline Service. So the developers, developers only focus on creating the solution. Okay, so this is the solution design in more detail. Uh, sensing pipeline is the, um, is, so what is sensing pipeline? It's, it's the connecting of uh, simple tasks uh, to complete a more complex and um, meaningful task. Okay, so a simple task may be uh, a, a, a small AI component that uh, detects an object and outputs a uh, bounding box, which is useful, but by itself, uh, it doesn't really, um, it's not enough. Right? Typically, you, you get that output and, and do something else with it. So uh, sensing pipeline. So typically, what we Im imagine is that the data coming from the sensor is going to be uh, processed in a, a predefinable sequence of tasks. Okay? And, and, and that's basically what sensing pipeline is. Uh, it defines the, the sequence of tasks and, and the relationships between them, input and output. Um, by breaking a big task into small components, now, now we allow the uh, composability and the reusability of these WASM modules, right, which didn't exist before. <clears throat> and, and these uh, nodes, these pipeline nodes, now can be uh, represented and created, constructed using uh, uh, visual tools and low-code, uh, no-code tools. Okay? So it makes it even easier for developers to to uh, design the solution. Um, again, I'm re reiterating my pr uh, previous point, but here developers are detached from the actual instantiation of the design. So you basically poke, so basically the, the green box on the left here is what the, the designing phase is, right? So developers are basically using uh, some tool, constructing a pipeline and submitting that design to the service, and the rest is taken care of. And how does it, how does it uh, take care of it? Okay, I'm sorry about the uh, misalignment of that box there. Um, so this is the instantiation process. Uh, so you need to have the device, right? That's where the, the WebAssembly module is gonna be spawned, right? So you, you need to provision the device. Um, what else do you need? You need to compile the, the, the source code to run on that device. Right, so as I mentioned before, this is done through the, the collaboration between the EVP agents who's recording the information about the device and uh, uh, sensing pipeline service that is doing the, the ahead of time compilation. Then uh, you actually have to deploy the device right, on the device uh, with proper access to the hardware resources. And uh, the last case, uh, last thing here is interesting as well. Um, as you can see here, uh, you have a pipeline of three nodes, and, there are, and, and the first two nodes are instantiated on, um, on the device, and the third one is on Mac, right? So when the, de when the developer was creating the sensing pipeline, he or she was not aware of exactly where this is gonna be deployed or what format, right? But the sensing pipeline service has determined that this is the optimal deployment strategy for this. Right, and all the networking connectivity is uh, configured automatically by the Sensing Pipeline Service and EVP agent. Okay, so uh, now I wanna show a demo, okay? So uh, this demo, uh, let me explain the setup here. The demo, uh, it does the, um, it's basically a license plate detection and reading. So as, as an input, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, use a Japanese license plate, okay? And, and this sensing uh, pipeline application is going to, going to detect that license plate and eventually gonna extract the characters on that license plate and send it out to the cloud as a telemetry data, okay? Um, for the, uh, the device is a Raspberry Pi based camera set up in Barcelona office. We have a Barcelona office. Um, and, that, and that device is running EVP agent. Uh, we have a uh, sensing pipeline service, service running in the cloud and a things board being used as the IoT platform. So things board is gonna be used for uh, device provisioning. Uh, it's gonna be used to view the telemetry. And uh, we're gonna use Node-RED as the, uh, the visual tool to construct the sensing pipeline and to uh, associate the sensing pipeline to the device for deployment, okay? 
And uh, what else? Yeah, and in this demo, you're going to see all the uh, concepts that I, I talked about before, where uh, after you construct the sensing pipeline and you submit that to the sensing pipeline service, uh, it is going to do the uh, automatic ahead of time compilation. And uh, it's going to uh, deploy w uh, web as assembly modules with access to sensors and uh, uh, connect it properly to each other. And also to the cloud as well, the last node. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna start the demo. Apologies, I'm not used to using uh, PowerPoint and uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, all right, so this is a demo. Um, so this is a things board. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. So this is the IoT platform that we use. And uh, we're showing the step of uh, enrolling a device. Sorry for the small text, but here we're pasting the uh, device certificate, right? And uh, uh, by selecting OK here, we're effectively enrolling the device. Here, now you see the device is uh, enrolled, which means that the uh, EVP agent that is running on the device has not connected and reported uh, information, right? Um, so here, it's hard to see, but the system information is reported here, but there is no telemetry and there is no um, uh, module application running on the device at this point. It's a new device. OK, so here's node red. So next step is to construct the, construct the uh, um, sensing pipeline for license plate detection. So here uh, we're um, dragging in the device that we want to deploy the application onto. Okay, and next step is to actually define the sensing pipeline itself. And this license plate detection reading is a good example because it, it actually involves a lot of steps, as I'll explain. Okay, so first, extract. Okay, this is responsible for uh, detecting the license plate. And it has two outputs. Okay, so one is the uh, output tensor, and the other one is raw image. So in, in our sensing pipeline design, you could actually have multiple inputs and outputs. Uh, these are just annotations to, to indicate the, uh, what, the output, what the outputs are. Okay, so they don't do anything functionally, but it's easy for you guys to see, except it's a small text, so maybe you guys can't see it. Um, but it's basically saying uh, output tensor and raw image. Okay, so this is the uh, post-processing uh, node. So what we're doing here is that the, um, we're converting the uh, output tensor that's specific to the uh, network that was used in the first node into a common format so that the node after it doesn't need to know what was used previously. Okay, so this is um, just creating a common format. Here, we are connecting OpenCV. So what we're doing in OpenCV here is that we, are, we want to, now that the license plate has been detected, we want to uh, crop that section and resize it, okay? Um, and OpenCV is a tool we use for that. And OpenCV takes in two inputs. Um, one is the tensor and also uh, the raw image that was outputted from the first node, uh, which is going to be, which OpenCV is going to crop and resize. 
and also annotate with a bounding box. So OpenCV output is sent to um, a send image node, which basically just uh, streams the, the images out so that we can actually see the, these cropped, resized, annotated images from node red. And so here, now we're connecting the, um, uh, the nodes for the second round of detection. So now we've detected the license plate. Now we want to detect the characters on the license plate. Okay, so we're detecting the license plate character areas and then uh, doing the, the post-processing again to uh, make it a common format. And then now, finally, we're extracting the characters. And the extracted characters, we're going to send it to the cloud as telemetry data. There you go. So now that we've defined the uh, solution of uh, license plate detection reading, we're going to associate it with the device for deployment. Now it's deployed. Here, you now see that the EVP agent has reported the uh, modules that is, uh, is instantiated on the device. So you see all the, the, the modules there, right? Extract and post-processing and so forth. And now we're going to show the actual uh, demo of the license plate uh, detection. Here, we're, we're using Japanese license plates. Um, so these are telemetry that's sent to things board, so we can, we can uh, see it there. We're just enlarging it to make it easier to see. So this is happening in real time together, the image and the telemetry. So uh, this, this is like a conceptual demo here, this part, where we're going to show that uh, a single application can be deployed on two different types of devices. So um, we have the two devices uh, of type ARM and then one x86, which you will see later. And uh, this is how you would do the deployment on these devices with one call. And uh, what happens behind the scene is that, as I explained before, there will be an autom uh, automatic, dynamic, uh, ahead of time compilation happening by, uh, you know, performed by sensing pipeline service. And the write executable is going to be uh, deployed on these devices. So this is the last part of the demo. Um, I want to show the cust uh, customizability of the, uh, our platform. So we were running uh, license plate recognition before. And now we're going to replace that on Node Red with a different application. And if, when you deploy this on a device, it'll, it'll switch. And this new application is, is a face detection. So after this, you see that the uh, license plate reading, uh, detection reading, is going to be um, switched over to face detection instantly. This is basically doing the same thing as the uh, license plate uh, detection, except that it's using, um, it's detecting a face instead. And here we're just sending the video stream and instead of, uh, we're not sending anything to the, to the things board, okay? Deploy. Now you see that the uh, uh, new modules are running. Sorry, it's not zoomed here, um, but modules have been updated. And you see it on the left side, on well, node red, you see the, uh, the, the, uh, face, uh, the face detection working. Okay, so that's the demo. Let me see the next page. Okay, um, we're showing the demo at the booth, so if you have questions about that, uh, please come by the booth and we can ask all the questions there. Uh, so for the next couple of slides, we wanna talk about the ecosystem expansion work that we're doing, and uh, I'm gonna hand it off to Kenji. Hi. Uh, my name is Kenji Shimizu from Minokure Japan, and my role is um, Alliance Manager. And I'm going to talk about uh, another topic, uh, it, which is uh, fragmentation, another pain point for IoT devices. And yeah, as uh, Ryu mentioned uh, uh, in the previous slide, uh, I'm going to uh, open source the part of, part of uh, software mentioned here. And in addition to that, um, yeah, we need to solve another 
uh, problem, which is called uh, fragmentation. So uh, this slide shows a well-known picture for uh, uh, to represent uh, fragmentation of Android. And yeah, uh, there's because there is a lot of fragmentation for uh, Android in the early stage, so it was very difficult for developers to make an uh, application which can run uh, properly on the every devices. So we think that uh, the same thing will happen for uh, IoT devices. So uh, we, uh, to avoid from such fragmentation problem, uh, we want to uh, propose and design the software stack, uh, device stack, uh, with partners, including uh, device vendors. Uh, and th yeah, this uh, slide showed the uh, device stack, which is uh, still a uh, work in progress. But uh, it shows the list of what we want for uh, such a stack, software stack. And one, uh, firstly, uh, we need an abstraction layer for multiple, op uh, multiple operating systems and CPU type, like a instruction architecture with WebAssembly runtime. And uh, we want application developers to utilize uh, standard application interface like um, WASI, uh, WebAssembly system uh, interface. So by using such a, a standard uh, interface with uh, slight extension capability, uh, the application developers can easily access to uh, devices like uh, sensors or storage, something like that. And we want to include some uh, third-party app user applications, uh, such as um, like an AI uh, simple uh, software module, like uh, object detection and pose estimation, and which is run in a sandbox environment safely, thanks to our WebAssembly runtime. And we want to include some uh, system, uh, system applications and yeah, system application is uh, for a uh, device and was module and machine learning model lifecycle management. And we want to include some uh, connectivity management. Connecti connectivity means a uh, connection between the device agent software and the cloud service. So yeah, it's still in the tent tentative. So we need to design with uh, parallels. And uh, yeah, ex ecosystem expansion. So we will take a um, collaboration-based approach to make th this thing happen. And we need to support a variety of, of uh, de facto technologies of cloud, network, IoT platform, and operating system, other thing, a lot of things. So uh, yeah. This I showed a uh, uh, relevant project from uh, Linux Foundation. Uh, so we, need, we want to collaborate with uh, people from this uh, very uh, relevant communities. And at the same time, we will, uh, uh, we will plan to establish uh, alliance of uh, devices stack I mentioned in the previous slide uh, in the near future. Thank you. Uh, this is the uh, end of my, uh, in this our presentation. Uh, thank you. So the platform is still under development and we expect and we are now preparing for uh, open sourcing some key component of the system. And yeah, we welcome your feedback and hope you interest in the project. Thank you very much. We can't take questions. I think we have time, right? Ah, so the question is, um, how about the performance of the uh, 
uh, WASM uh, compared to the native okay, um, on the eight devices. We actually have a comparison done for this benchmark of, of interpretive mode, um, you know, uh, AOT compiled mode, and native. So it's, it's near um, native performance, not quite there, uh, but it's, uh, I, I can't recall the exact numbers, but I, I can get the, uh, the, answer, the exact uh, benchmark numbers if, uh, later, you know, but it, it, it's actually pretty near native, you know, native speed. Yeah, sorry, I can't give you the exact numbers, but it's close. And, but it's much better than interpretive mode, by the way. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I think it's lunch time, so we'll end it here. And uh, yeah, thank you for the uh, for attending this talk, and uh, enjoy your lunch. <laughs>